All right, let's conclude this unit with a quick discussion on a very useful technique to extend multiple variable linear models to classes of nonlinear systems. If you know how to use this technique well, you'll be able to approach a much larger class of problems. Okay, so let's to introduce the technique. Let's start with our standard linear model that we've been talking about up to now. In this case, we have features x1 to xd, and we make a prediction based on taking a linear sum of these features. But this linear model might obviously be too restrictive. Just as a simple case, imagine we had the data on the right here. Clearly, the relation between x and y in this case is nonlinear. If you tried to fit a linear relationship like this, you would get a straight line, and that obviously wouldn't be a good prediction. So somehow we need a more rich class of functions. One way to do this is to, instead of looking at the problem in the linear form, look at it in a transform form like this, where we say that the prediction y hat is a linear combination, not of the x's directly, but some nonlinear predefined functions of x. Each such function is called a basis function. And they can be nonlinear and functions of multiple variables. So for example, the first function, if you had two variables x1 and x2, could be a function of x1, could be a function of x2, or could be a function of both x1 and x2. And I'll give you several examples as we go on. Once you write it in this form, it will be sometimes useful to define the vector of all of the basis functions. So for each x, you get a p-dimensional vector. And in this case, the prediction is the inner product between boldface v and beta. Before we do some examples of these transformed linear models, let's just quickly show how you can fit them. So again, in the transformed linear model, prediction y hat is a linear combination of basis functions phi 1 of x to phi p of x. We can fit this actually using exactly the same techniques that we had for the linear case. Specifically, imagine we have data samples x i, y i, and we have n of them. What we want to do is to find to predict a model from these transformed variables phi j to the target y. So we just treat these phi j of x's just like we treated the xj's. Specifically, we define the transformed matrix in this case, where there are p columns, and in each column are the features, are the basis functions for the n samples. So this is an n by p matrix. In this case, on the training data, the vector of predicted values will just again be the matrix multiplication of this transformed matrix with the betas. In particular, then, we can just use the least squares bit, just like we did before, from our least squares solution equation, A transpose A inverse times A transpose Y. OK, let's start with the first simple example. Suppose that Y depended on a scalar, var scalar variable X, um, and we had data like these purple points here. Clearly, a linear fit is not a very good fit for that data because there's a more complicated relationship between x and y. So what we might try to do is fit a polynomial model where y is a polynomial function with some order d. So for example, if we took the third, fifth, or ninth order, we can see that kind of possible fit here with getting increasingly more complex types of relationships as we increase the order. We'll talk about how to select the order D in the next um, unit, but imagine for now that it's just given. Okay, well, once I fix the motor, model order D, we can try to fit it um, just like before. We have the data samples Xi and Yi, and imagine we have N of them. In this case, to capture the basis functions, or the polynomial model, we would define our basis functions phi j just to be x to the power of j, and we would use d plus 1 of these basis functions. 
When you make that definition, the transform model is just a linear combination of these basis functions, and the transform matrix is just um, each row, each, sorry, column of A will just be the data to the power D. And then we can um, compute the beta hat just as we saw in the previous slide. Again, we'll talk about how to select the D in the next lecture. Let's do a couple more um, simple examples. A generalization of the previous case is what you would call a multinomial model. So in this case, instead of having a scalar input, you have, say, two possible target features, x1 and x2. And then our expression y hat has a linear combination of terms with the x1s, the x2s, but also polynomial terms in them, like x1 squared and x2 squared, and even mixed terms like x1, x2. You could continue imagine doing this for higher orders or larger numbers of features. In this case, though, we're only looking at all the second order terms. To um, use the transform linear model in this case, we let the parameter vector beta be all the unknown coefficients, the a's, the b's, and the c's. And then we just define the basis functions to be the corresponding function, nonlinear functions for those coefficients, namely a constant term here, terms with the x1, x2, and then the terms with the second order terms, the x1 squared, the x1, x2, and the x2 squared. Um, again, note that all of these basis functions are nonlinear functions of x1 and x2, some of them using both x1 and x2 together. Let's do another example where we had an exponential model so we had a linear combination of exponential terms like this. Now imagine that the parameters beta1 to beta d, or b1, sorry, to bd are fixed. That is, you do know them somehow. So you know somehow the rate of decay of these parameters. And the only thing that you need to actually solve for are the a1s to a to the d terms. In this case, since the b1s to bds are fixed, we would define our parameters just with the a coefficients, and we'd let our transformed vector have all the exponentials. This is okay as long as the b1s are, and to bds are known, because then you can compute v of x from that data. If the b1s to bds are not fixed, then the model is nonlinear in these parameters, and you can't use the transformed linear method like I've shown here, or at least not directly. Um, let's do another type of example, which often occurs when you have a linear model and you want to do something called reparametrization. So let's say somebody gives you um, a relationship like this, where they say y hat they know is related to x1 and x2 through this relation, but they don't know the coefficients a and b. So this has two unknown parameters that we want to solve for. The problem, of course, is that when it's written like this, the output y is nonlinear in the parameters. And you can see that because I can um, expand this product, and you can see here that I have an a, b term um, on the second uh, term. Now, a quick way to get around this is to define new parameters such that it will be linear. So in particular, you pick b1 to be a, you pick b2 to be this product, and now y hat is just beta1 times x1 plus beta2 times x1 e to the minus x2. So it's linear in these two functions. Once it's linear, we can define our basis functions for the two terms, and then we can solve for beta1 and beta2 from data. After you have beta1 and beta2, if you want to go back and solve for a, you can just invert these equations. So you can say if a is beta 1, and then b is just um, beta 2 over a. Here's a more interesting example um, that often happens with what's called time series data. So in time series data, instead of having a single point, you have actually a sequence of points, which are samples of some uh, variable over time. So this occurs, for example, a lot of mechanical problems 
A lot of any physical problems or biological problems often have this as well. So imagine, for example, I have a picture here of an airplane, and the inputs are controls to that airplane, like the rudders or thrust, and I measure some outputs like the velocity or angle or position. Now, in this case here, you wouldn't imagine that the velocity at any time is just a function of the thrust at that time. It will be a function of not just that thrust, but uh, previous inputs in previous times. To capture these kind of relationships, people often describe these as linear dynamical systems, where the output y at time k is a function of the input at time k, but also past inputs as well as past output values. If you've taken any linear systems class or signals and systems, you'll be very familiar with this. But if you haven't taken it, don't worry. You can just uh, treat it like some mathematical relationship. But if you have taken those classes, you'll recognize this as um, through its what's called transfer function with the numerator and denominator polynomials. Again, though, if you don't uh, know this, don't worry about it. Just think about it as some type of relationship between input and output data over time. Now, one problem that you might have when you're trying to model these relationships is that you want to learn these coefficients, that's the a and b's from input-output data. That is, we want to find the parameter vector beta, which includes all those coefficients. It turns out you can actually solve this just using linear reg regression. You can, given some training data, you can write the predicted values as some transform matrix A times these coefficient mate vectors. You just have to organize this matrix A with the values from Y and X correctly. And they're going to do that in your homework, so I won't go over, go over it right now. This has a lot of applications, so it's a super useful technique. Um, of course, it's used in any times where there's dynamics, and that occurs in any mechanical system, particularly, for example, robotics happen in most biological systems, will happen, of course, in many electrical systems, but it's also used for things like uh, financial systems as well, and things like speech modeling, just as a few examples where this is useful. One final technique that's useful when we're thinking about these extensions is called one-hot coding. So imagine that the feature xj is a categorical variable. Categorical variable is just a var variable that can take a discrete number of um, categories. Just as an example, suppose I'm trying to predict the price of a car given the model and the interior space, so two features. The model is a categorical variable because it can take on, let's say, three values, Ford, BMW, or GM. Now, you can think, well, I can fit a linear model. Well, first, what I'm going to do is I'm going to assign um, a number to each one of these. Say four to zero, BMW is one, and GM is two. And then I'm going to write Y as a linear combination of X1 and X2. But that doesn't really make sense if you think about it. Because let's say that you assign GM to be two and BMW to be one. Then whatever the effect of being BMW is, because X1 is one, it'll be twice the effect in GM. And there's no reason a priori to believe that that would be the relationship. So clearly you can't do it directly. A, more, um, a better way is to use what's called one-hot coding. So what you do is you add three binary features called phi1, phi2, and phi3, as shown here. So when the x1 is Ford, you set phi1 to be 1, and when it's BMW, you set phi2 to be 1, and when it's GM, you set phi3 to be 1. And then all the, all the other cases are 0. And now you write y as a linear combination of these transformed features. Now let's take a look at what happens. When, you, um, when the uh, car is a Ford, the phi2 and the phi3 will be 0, so the output will be this expression. So it will be the linear combination, some bias plus weight. And when it's BMW and GM, it'll be like these two. So what you can see is that you have three models with different intercepts for each car, 
but the same slope. You could also modify this to have different slopes as well, or more complicated types of relationships, but at least this is something sensible. Okay, now you'll be ready to start the lab and the homework for this unit. Um, the lab, what you're going to do is use this very useful data set from TU Dortmund. Um, and what they've done here is collected a large amount of data from actual robots. In this particular case, I'm going to have you predict the current draw. That might be useful, say, to predict the power consumption of the robot from various predictors um, of the mechanical state of that uh, robot. But you can go ahead and use this data set to do all sorts of interesting things, um, and you might want to use that for your project. Also, um, but before you go ahead and do that, you should try the in-class exercise first, which is a much simpler problem, just to give you a quick idea of how to do the multiple linear regression. You can find it on the GitHub site at this notebook here, and you can just run that entirely on Google Colab, or if you prefer, you can do it on your local machine, assuming you've installed all the software.